You're listening to Central Time. I'm Rob Ferret. It's Independence Day, as you might have noticed, and our next guest says it's a good time to mark the history of giving in the U.S. She says philanthropy is closely intertwined with American history, and today's a good day to reflect on that history and make plans on giving back to the world in the future. Lisa Dietland joins us now. She's a philanthropy expert and president and CEO of Lisa M. Dietland & Associates. Her new book, by the way, is The Power of Three, How to Achieve Your Goals by Simply Doing Three Things a Day. Lisa, welcome back to the show. Happy Fourth of July. Glad to be back. And to you as well. Well, you call Independence Day the nonprofit sector's birthday. Why is that? I do. You know, it occurred to me uh, probably a couple of years ago when I was thinking about this holiday and my love of this holiday that, you know, on this day, our founding fathers, with much encouragement from our founding mothers, signed that Declaration of Independence disavowing allegiance to King George, the King of England. And at that time, a king or a queen, a monarch, as well as a state religion, provided all the resources needed for their people. What they did is they made sure there was money, Rob, for the orphanages and the libraries and the museums and the schools and the hospitals and the workhouses and the poorhouses, and they made sure that people were taken care of. Now, it might not have been the best way, you know, and the best care, but they made sure that those resources were there. So when those founding fathers signed that Declaration of Independence, saying we're not going to be part of England anymore, they actually formed the nonprofit sector. So I think it's our birthday. Happy birthday to the nonprofit <laughs> sector. And does uh, nonprofit, does, does independent giving to those kinds of things you're talking about uh, go back that far in American history? It does. You know, um, many people um, ask that question, and I, there's a couple examples. One is, you know, when the Mayflower landed here, there was no, you know, school or hospital for them to go to if they needed, wanted to educate their children or they had a wound or a, an injury. And if they wanted that in their community as well as a church or any other sort of um, library or social good, they had to build it themselves, and they had to take up collections or neighbor helping neighbor. And you know, when you think about um, the movie era of the 1950s depicting the great western migration of this country, you would see barn dances along with barn raisings and quilting bees and harvests. And, you know, America is rich. We're considered the most generous people in the world, and it's about neighbor helping neighbor. You know, we always step up when there's something to be done, and it's in our DNA from the time we set foot on the shores and realized we're in this, you know, for better or worse, and let's make it better. So fast forwarding to the modern day, how important is our nonprofit sector? Our nonprofit sector is huge. What most people don't realize, Rob, is that twelve first of all, twelve million people work in this sector. That's ten percent of the workforce. It's the third largest employment sector after retail and manufacturing. More people actually work in the nonprofit sector than work in the automotive industry or that work in the oil and gas industry or that work in the electronics industry. We are about 5.5% of the GDP. We contribute about $335 billion a year. You know, 65 million of us volunteer every year, and nobody grows up and says, hey, Mom and Dad, I'm going to work for a charity when I get older. So how much time do we tend to donate here in the United States? We donate a lot of time. Um, Americans, about 25% of our population volunteer annually, and they give about $8 billion, that's with a B, Rob, about $8 billion hours to charity, which is valued at almost $200 billion, um, the, the amount of hours that we donate. And we do everything. It's from lawyers at a legal aid clinic volunteering their time whether it be for um, a criminal or a civil case, or we hear much about the innocence projects throughout this country when people have been wrongly convicted, where lawyers step up and often volunteer their time to help exonerate people, to, you know, graphic artists being willing to donate their time to design invitations, or doctors are going to where Doctors Without Borders operate. All across the spectrum, Americans use their skills, and it can be sure, you know, brute force too you know with the hurricane that's roaring up the east coast and thankfully it's tamed down a lot now but those that come together to help a neighbor you know prepare their house or sand put sandbags together so rivers don't flood those are all volunteers that are making a difference in this country you know when we hear economics reporting we do hear the automotive industry a lot energy technology things like that does the nonprofit sector do things like donating and volunteering kind of fly under the radar they absolutely do. You know, it was really, it's really amazing. This summer I have a 
group of interns from Harvard and UMass Amherst and Northwestern University. And when I asked them this week, we met, and I said, what have you learned so far? Because they've been with me about a month. And they said, I never knew you could make a living in the nonprofit sector. I never knew it was this big. And so, you know, here we have very smart students that want to give back, that are volunteering their time to help learn about the nonprofit sector. And they're saying, gosh, I didn't know that this whole sector existed. But think about it, Rob. When you have a hospital that has a nonprofit um, status, a nonprofit, you know, coding from the IRS, every single position in that hospital is related to a nonprofit, whether you're the security person, the parking lot attendant, the um, person who's the head of IT or works in the IT department or accounting or the pharmacy or the janitorial staff or the cooking people in the kitchen that prepare the food for the, um, the patients that are in the beds during these holiday times and regular season. They are all working for a nonprofit organization, so it absolutely does fly under the radar. I think part of the reason it does is because we're not singly focused. You know, automotive is automotive. Oil and gas is oil and gas. We do arts. We do animals. You know, we do environment. We're involved in every part of a human being's life, from, you know, animals to A to Z, as they say, animals to zoology. And both of those I know are animals, but <laughs> the point being, we're involved in all aspects of society. Well, let's look for some inspiration on the birthday of the nonprofit sector for maybe ways for people to get involved in donating and volunteering. Um, a lot of, uh, of veterans will be out participating in Fourth uh, of July parades today, and I know you are looking at today as a good way, to, a good time to think about what people can do when it comes to veterans. Absolutely. You know, the veterans, obviously, in the VA have been in the news a lot and for a lot of negative reasons, but we still have military personnel that either are returning home or that are here and in need of our services. And there's many ways to get involved. Obviously, most parades have probably already taken place, but some communities might have activities this weekend. So one of the easiest things to do is go out and participate in your community events that are honoring veterans where there might be um, gatherings and memorials taking place and thank them, thank them for their service. Many times in many communities um, have VFWs, DAVs, or American Legions. And again, many veterans gather there. You could stop by, see if an activity is taking place, or simply sit and talk to those individuals that are in that establishment and ask them to tell you their story. Ask them to tell you what they went through or what America means to them. And take your children with you. This is an excellent opportunity for the next generation to learn about what our veterans have done, what people have done who have given and who have served for this country. But if you can't do that, you know, write a letter. We still have men and women serving that many of which don't get packages and letters. And there's a wonderful organization called AnySoldier.com, and you can write a letter mail it to anysoldier.com, you know, look the address up, mail it there, and they will make sure it gets to a military personnel person. So you could uh, obviously thank them today, and they would get it in a couple of weeks, the letter. We also have the Wounded Warriors Project. You know, many of our veterans are returning, and because um, the, I guess, the advancements in technology and the way we fight wars and the way we're able to treat people after, there's more survivors, but there's more people coming back with injuries, losing a limb, losing their eyesight. And there's a Wounded Warrior Project standing by them saying, we're going to provide the resources that these individuals need because they've made the sacrifice. We also have Operation Homefront for families who are here while their loved one is serving, and they do amazing work, too. All great organizations, as well as the USO, who's still entertaining. Bob Hope may not be here, but we have many you know, entertainers and artists who give up their time to go and entertain our troops, and they are always looking for donations and support. So you've mentioned a bunch of organizations there. Even if people don't get out and do the volunteering or, or make the contact this weekend, this might be a good weekend to get out there and search around for a group to get involved with, veterans or otherwise. And maybe is there such a thing as making a philanthropy and volunteering plan? Absolutely. I always recommend that. And I love that idea, Rob, that here on the 4th of July, let's make a plan of action for the rest of the year, the next six months. You know, we tend to only think about charity or philanthropy around the holidays, um, Thanksgiving and Christmas primarily, or we tend to think about it as part of our New Year's resolution. I'm going to volunteer every month. I'm going to give back. I'm going to do better this year. 
But actually today, you, many families are gad, gathered together. Many families and friends are gathered together. And why not start making your plan of action for the next six months of how you're going to give back? And again, you can go and do something. You can write a letter. You can make a charitable donation. You can commit to volunteer on a regular basis. Any one of those will truly make a difference in your community and throughout society. We're talking to philanthropy expert Lisa Dietlin about giving, volunteering, philanthropy in the United States. You can join in at 800-642-1234. Have you made a commitment to make donations of your time, money, or talent lately? Uh, Where do you make your donations? Where do you volunteer and why? Or have you been thinking about taking a step to doing something like this, but maybe need some encouragement from Lisa or some advice? Call 800-642-1234. Two, three, four, or send an email, talk at WPR.org. This is Central Time. I'm Rob Ferret. We continue our conversation about philanthropy and the American past, present, and future. Our guest is philanthropy expert Lisa Dietlin. You can join the conversation. Tell us who you donate your time or money to and, and why you do it. Or if you want to give a thank you to donors or volunteers who made a difference for you in your life or maybe for your organization, give them a shout out, 800-642-1234. That's 800-642-1234. You can also email talk at WPR.org. Lisa, just a few moments ago, you mentioned families are together. This is a good time to make plans. Talk about the idea of getting the family together to decide who to make donations to or maybe even going out and volunteering as a family. You know, it's a wonderful holiday, the 4th of July, and of course this year it falls on a Friday, so many families are coming together for an extended weekend. And I think, you know, having a conversation around giving back and where are we going to direct our donations this year and or our time as a family is perfectly appropriate as we remember, you know, the, the meaning of this day that we were disavowing allegiance to a king and saying we're going to do it on our own and we're still doing that 238 years later. So one of my ideas is as you're sitting around tonight over the barbecue or over the weekend hanging out with family and friends, talk about what you care about. Talk about what's important. Have that healthy discussion. Maybe even take up a collection first. You know, everybody put some money in the pot and take up a collection and say, okay, who are we going to donate this to? And um, what are we going to what are we going to say about why we're donating it? And have that discussion about why it's important to give back. And it doesn't matter the sum of money, and it's the the importance of having that healthy discussion and looking ahead to the fall, so that when the holidays come, you have a plan too for giving back in your community. And how do you cultivate the idea of giving and volunteering for kids in particular? Well, that's that's a great question, and kids are so impressionable. You know, they do they what their parents do, and I often see billboards saying, you know, exercise, you know, your children are looking, or eat healthy, your children are looking, while also giving back, you know, your children are looking. And I think there's a couple things you can do. One is you could give your children an allowance or a, a certain amount of money and say that they have to give it away and they have to tell the family the story of what they're going to do. And perhaps today is the day. Maybe each child gets twenty, fifty, a hundred dollars, and they're told that when the family comes back together at Christmas, they have to share what they did with that money. And the only thing is, they can't spend it on themselves, and they can't keep it. Meaning, they have to help someone else, and that's the only direction to give them. I've heard of a couple that um, they're friends of mine, and they do this with their grandsons. And they started when they were five and seven, Rob. And they gave them, you know, like three $5 bills. And they said, you can't spend it on yourself or anyone in the family, but and you can't keep it, but you have to give it and you have to, you know, tell us why and who you gave it to and why you chose to do that. And the boys were so excited and they made their donations and they came back and they told the grandparents. And the next year they asked the grandparents, are we going to do it again? So they were learning already, Rob. They were learning. And this young generation, the millennials, are so committed to giving back. We see it all the time with... You know, their social media posts and their what they care about and what they, they think is important. It's not about, to them, how, the title or the job that they get. A lot of the, For a lot of them, it's about are they making a difference in a world that they grew up in that was post-9-11 where people went to work one day and didn't come home because other people flew 
planes into buildings. And they grew up in that world, and they say, you know what, there's more important things than having a really big bank account or driving the most fancy car that I can possibly think of. They want to make a difference in other people's lives. So supposing we're, we don't have a ton of money uh, yep. to make a difference, how do we find an organization, an effort that's a good match for us that we can, we can kind of make a difference for? There's a couple, um, that I, a couple websites I recommend going to. One is volunteermatch.org. Volunteermatch.org, it's based out of San Francisco, but it works nationally, and it lists organizations that are looking for volunteers, both those that are kid-friendly and those that are for adults only. That's an excellent place to start. Another one is womenoncall.org. It's another national organization started um, by a friend of mine, and she started it because women oftentimes don't have blocks of time to give, but they have an hour to give, or they might have an hour a night to give to work on a project. So both nonprofit organizations list projects that they need help on, as well as individuals Women can go on and say, I would like to donate. I'm a lawyer. I'd like to, I'd be willing to review contracts or write a contract or I'm a graphic artist. And they actually help and they do that match. So those are great organizations to, great organizations to go to for information. But one of the best ones is in your own hometown if you have a community foundation or if you have a house of worship you attend. You know, go to your community foundation or call them and ask, you know, what's the greatest need? Where can we volunteer? You know, especially if you want to involve your kids. Or go to your house of worship and ask, where is there a need and where can we make a difference? You know, when it comes to giving, getting into a habit of something like exercise, a lot of times I hear advice uh, along lines of make it social, make it a social activity. Can the same thing be true with uh, philanthropy, however we approach it? Absolutely, it can be. And I think it's more fun when you do it with someone. You know, philanthropy is a great way to meet other people. You know, when you volunteer, whether you're raking senior citizens' um, lawns or, you know, you're painting a wall of a senior center or you're stuffing backpacks with food for kids, there's great ways to meet other people. But it's also good to have a buddy because if you know somebody's meeting you there, oftentimes you're more likely to show up or less likely to make an excuse that you can't go. I love the idea, you know, when we think about gifts for our parents and our siblings saying, you know what, you have what you need, or I don't know what to buy you, who needs another candle or another tie or what have you, but why don't we once a month volunteer? Why don't we once a month do something together so we can spend time together and we can also be making a difference in our community? an email from Nancy in Green Bay. She writes, my husband and I are volunteer tutors for literacy in Green... Oh, for the group, sorry, Literacy Green Bay. We work with an adult uh, from Mexico, helping them learn English. We meet twice a week for an hour and a half each time. Nancy writes, we get as much from it as our students do. I love that. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you to you and your husband. That's fabulous. And there is such a need um, for tutors in the literacy field. I've learned about this recently, that there is a great number of individuals in our country who are illiterate, who aren't um, proficient in English. So if that is something that is a passion of yours, absolutely volunteer throughout the country and follow Nancy and her husband's lead. And Lisa, I mentioned uh, earlier your new book is called The Power of Three, How to Achieve Your Goals by Simply Doing Three Things a Day. And I know it's about taking something that looks big and monumental, breaking it into pieces, doing a little bit at a time. How could we apply that to making ourselves philanthropists? That is an excellent question, and I have an answer. I was just out on a walk with a, a friend this morning, and we were talking, and my shoe came untied. And I bent down to pick it up, tie the shoe, and there was a piece of garbage there. And I picked up the garbage. It was a wrapper that was flying around. And she looked at me quizzically, and I said, well, every day I pick up a piece of garbage. It's one of the three things I do to make a difference in my community. Huh. I said, I pick up a piece of garbage, Rob. I try to write a piece, piece of personal correspondence to somebody, you know, thanking them for something they did or congratulating them for something they did. And the third thing I try to do is smile or acknowledge everyone as well as pay a compliment. Um, I learned last year while I was kayaking on this trip on the Chicago River that this man shared with me that his friend smiles or acknowledges everyone he meets because he read a research study that said the number one cited reason that people who are contemplating suicide don't commit it is because somebody acknowledged them or smiled at them. And his friend 
thinks when he smiles all day long or acknowledges people, when he puts his head on the pillow at night, he's most likely saved a life. Wow. And I thought, I'm going to do that too. So, you know, I could say, you know, make a donation every day, volunteer an hour, but really for the listeners, if you can do three things, pick up a piece of garbage and put it in the receptacle, write a piece of personal correspondence to someone and smile or acknowledge everyone you meet, you'll be making a difference and having a huge impact in your community. Lisa, that's amazing. And, you know, I keep using the word philanthropy kind of on purpose because when I think that word, I think of somebody handing a giant million-dollar check to the children's (laughs) hospital, which is great. I don't want to discourage anybody from doing that. (laughs) But thinking that way can discourage us from tackling those little things. Right. You know, philanthropy at its root means brotherly love, Rob. I mean, it's looking out for your neighbor, and that's what Independence Day was about. In Independence Day... You know, those men who signed the Declaration of Independence were looking out for each other, whether they were from Connecticut or Georgia or they were from, you know, New York. They were looking out for each other and saying, this isn't right. We're going to do better. We're going to have a better world. And it doesn't mean you have to have a million dollars or a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars to give to someone. You can truly make a difference by simply acknowledging someone, smiling at them, telling them what a difference they made in your life, writing a piece of correspondence, picking up a piece of garbage, the list goes on and on. One of my favorites is, you know, when you're going to the post office to buy a book of stamps, buy one for your favorite nonprofit and give it to them. You know, put it in the mail, send it to them. Nonprofits need stamps. Or if you're a business owner and you're buying a box with reams of paper from Quill or Staples or, you know, whatever supply company you go to, order an extra box of copy paper and send it to your favorite nonprofit. There are so many easy ways to be a philanthropist. I would say to the listeners, do not become uncomfortable with that term. Become comfortable. Embrace it, especially on the 4th of July. Lisa, great talk. As always, thank you so much for joining us on Independence Day. Happy 4th of July. That's Lisa Dietland. She's a philanthropy expert. She's president and CEO of Lisa M. Dietland and Associates. Her new book is The Power of Three, How to Achieve Your Goals by Simply Doing Three Things a Day. I'm Rob Ferrett. This is Central Time here on the Ideas Network.